All right. Um, there was a, a, a plane that um, a pilot was flying with uh, 99 passengers. And uh, the warnings that came from air traffic control was that they were too high and too fast. Uh, and they were still 15 miles out from the runway. And you have to understand one thing that air traffic control is there to help you. Their job, and I learned as I was learning to fly, their job is to keep me safe. If you're controlled airspace, they, they decide how far apart you fly and how, how quickly you come in and land and take off and all of that. So it's very important. And so this one plane was warned by the, uh, the air traffic controllers, again, out of compassion, out of love. Uh, it's telling them that they're 15 miles out and they should be at 7,000 feet. And why are they at 10,000? To which uh, the warning was not taken. And so a little bit later, he was, he, air traffic control anyway, warned this pilot three times before his response finally was, I'm satisfied. I'll handle this situation. I'm satisfied with the situation. Otherwise, I'm satisfied being at 10,000 feet. <laughs> and as we come in for a landing here, I, I'm satisfied and I, I, I'll handle it. And so that was his response to being too high and too fast. Needless to say, that plane crashed and they lost 97 passengers. Two miraculously, they said, survived. But uh, not heeding the warning signs. Uh, can cause problems. You know that even in a car, a car is a little safer though when you're on the ground and a, a check engine light comes on, right? It tells you there's probably something wrong, but it's not, it's yellow, you know, yellow's not so, so bad, I like green lights. But if they come up yellow, it means you might have a problem, but it's probably not that desperate. Now, if your red light shows up on your dash, it's a little more serious. There's a reason it's red, right? I remember our son, Paul had a car too, and a he said after the day I picked him up on the, on the highway because the engine blew, uh, he said he was going to change the oil. He just kept meaning to do it. Yeah, the light was coming on. A uh, red light was kept flashing on. But he thought, well, I just go to work, come back, I'll change the oil. Well, he didn't quite make it home and that car was done. <laughs> so warning lights are, are for a purpose, especially if they're red and so on, but they're for our good, right? And for continuance to show us when to stop. And so life is full of, filled of things like that. And we'll see in this story later on how this kind of is applicable to this story that we're looking at here today. I'm just gonna briefly take the first 10 verses and kind of summarize them for you. There are four last kings in the kingdom of Judah. Remember the kings of Israel? Kids, maybe you can help me again. How many? Good kings were there in the kingdom of Israel in the north. Anybody help me? Zero. You got it right. Zero kings. Is that what you're going to say? Zero good kings in the northern kingdom of Israel. And in the south, they were mixed bag. But it gets to the final four here, and uh, that's where we pick up the story. Uh, Jehoahaz, Josiah was the last one we looked at, chapter 34 and 35. Uh, but his son is placed by the people as the new king, and he only re reigns for about three months. He rules for three months. The king of Egypt deposes him or takes him off the throne uh, and lays a tribute on the land or a fine on the land that you're going to be under my power now, and you owe me so many talents of, of silver and gold per year and really taxes him heavily. But you remember chapter 35, which we didn't really look at last year, week, but Josiah fought against Necho, the king of, of Egypt, fights against him and, and loses his life in that battle. Now, uh, he wasn't, that wasn't his business. He wasn't supposed to meddle there, but he did. And so now even the king of Egypt comes and takes his son, deposes him and takes him as a captive to Egypt. Uh, then the king of Egypt makes Eliakim, his brother, king over Judah, and changes his name to Jehoiakim, okay? It's kind of hard to keep these names straight. Sometimes uh, foreign powers will do that. They'll change your names. And uh, Jehoiakim uh, reigned for 11 years, and they did evil in the sight of the Lord and practiced abominations they never should. 
And where do we get that? Maybe I've been saying it over and over, week after week. When they said evil in the sight of the Lord, how we how do we know that they did evil? Anybody help me out? That's right. This is written right here, right? That's it. In the sight of the Lord. So, And they practice the abominations uh, that they shouldn't have been. Again, who calls things abominations? That's why we have no fear of contradiction to call what God calls an abomination in our day. Maybe what society looks on as good and proper now. Uh, still, nevertheless, in God's eyes, is an abomination. And so you have to learn to call what God calls sin or what God calls evil, evil. Because men will change it around. We, societies change what they think is good and right. And uh, so it always comes back with, again, in the sight of the Lord, they did evil in his sight. And then now an opposing king to the king of Egypt comes, and he's from the north. He comes from Babylon. And he comes to power. And he goes and uh, kind of takes care of the king of Egypt, but now he's also taking care of the king that he put up on the throne. And uh, so Nebuchadnezzar binds the last king, Jehoiakim, in chains and takes him to Babylon. And so he's a new superpower. And Jehoiachin, uh, his son, reigns for three months and ten days in Jerusalem, and he does what's evil in the sight of the Lord. And in the springtime, Nebuchadnezzar had, had him brought to Babylon and uh, then puts up Zedekiah to be the king of Judah and Jerusalem. And he reigns for 11 years. Okay, so he's, there's his last four kings, and he goes through them very quickly. Doesn't say much about them, but that they do evil in the sight of the Lord. And uh, this last king, Zedekiah, is the last king of Judah. And he reigns for 11 years. And if you pick up the story with me in verse 12, we'll just look at his life briefly. Verse 12 to 14, he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord his God. He did not humble himself before Jeremiah the prophet, who spoke from the mouth of the Lord. He also rebelled against King Nebuchadnezzar, who had made him swear by God. He stiffened his neck, hardened his heart against turning to the Lord, the God of Israel. And the, all the officers of the priests and of the people likewise were exceedingly unfaithful. <laughs> Things have come now to a pretty low ebb here. He quickly, the chronicler here, quickly goes through the last four kings of Judah. And all of them did evil in the sight of the Lord. Um, it's, it's just a reminder, too, that God sees us, doesn't he? Sees everything we do. Remember, uh, maybe when you were in Sunday school or something, they... You sang that song, Oh, be careful, little hands, what you do. Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. For the Father up above is looking down in love. So be careful, little ears, what you hear, and so on, with, uh, the different things. And that's a good song to learn because it's a good reminder that everything we do is done in the sight of the Lord. He sees it. And now that can be a comforting thing or it can be <laughs> a not-so-comfortable thing if you're walking in darkness, obviously. Um, nothing's hidden from his eyes. But remember, the reminder again in this book that uh, over and over again and through these different kings and uh, Jehoshaphat, I think it was said of him, that the, uh, the eyes of the Lord look to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose hearts is blameless or loyal towards him. God's looking for a man or woman, a child, anyone whom he loves to show himself strong. And I, I, in these last four kings, he just can't do it. He can't use this life. To show himself strong. Can't use this life in that, in that sense, you know, where he's looking for somebody to show himself strong on their behalf. And Zedekiah did evil, and it says, well, look at he says, he did not humble himself before Jeremiah the prophet, who spoke from the mouth of the Lord. So the prophet Jeremiah speaking, he's, he's God's spokesman. He's God's mouthpiece to the kings, and all the kings that have been going through it, right? Always had a prophet. God always had somebody to share his word with the people and with the kings. And But Zedekiah, he wouldn't humble himself. Remember, that's a key theme of this book. Humble yourself. Those that humble themselves, God blessed. And their, their, their reign went better. Even the most wicked king that ever had, Judah, and probably worse than almost Ahab because he's compared with Ahab in the north. Uh, even when he humbled himself, God was merciful to him, 
shed innocent blood, remember, from one end of Jerusalem to the other. And yet God pardoned him when he humbled himself. So uh, this guy wouldn't humble himself before the Lord. Uh, in Jeremiah chapter 32, I wrote it in the kids' notes. In a couple of places, you can find where Zed what Zedekiah did to him. He had Jeremiah put in prison. And then later on, he allowed some guys to put him in a pit. Way down, he was sinking in the mud, way in this deep, deep pit. And left to die, really. Zedekiah didn't care. The main reason he was throwing him in is, is he had the true prophets of God, and this is always the way it is, uh, true and, and false prophets. Jeremiah, by the word of the Lord, kept telling the people, listen, Babylon, the, the king of Babylon, he, Nebuchadnezzar, he's coming here. He's going to take us away captive to his land. He said, if you want to live, surrender to him. Surrender to him and, and go out to him and, and he'll allow you to live. If you don't, he'll, you, you're going to die of starvation in here. You're going to die of the sword. So why not do this? Well, that was a, uh, if it was, wasn't true, what he was doing is demoralizing the people, and you could lose your life for that, too. And that's the blame they gave to him. He's weakening our soldiers. The city's already under siege. Nebuchadnezzar's knocking on the door. He's got the city surrounded. The only thing protecting him is the wall. And he's setting siege works against it. And Jeremiah's prophesying surrender to him. <laughs> that's almost treason. It's almost... But it was what God had told, been telling them all along here, forever. And yet the false prophets were saying, no, don't surrender. Jeremiah's lying to you. Don't surrender. And so you had these two voices, but he was speaking again. He was the, the mouthpiece that God had, and the king wasn't listening to him. He wasn't humbling himself before him. He said he also rebelled against King Nebuchadnezzar, who had made him swear uh, by God. It means he, he swore his allegiance to him. And Zedekiah was really, in Ezekiel, you can see that. Uh, I won't take the time now to go through that. But um, what else here? Um, he rebelled against him. Nebuchadnezzar. He stiffened his neck and hardened his heart. And notice what, how he hardened his heart again. Against what? Against turning to the Lord. That was his problem. He wouldn't, he hardened his heart against turning to the Lord. In other words, the prophet's message is, listen, trouble's coming, but if you'll humble yourself and repent, there can be mercy. But again, he stiffened his neck and hardened his heart. Uh, Second Chronicles 24, 19, I've been keeping this one before us. As we've gone through the book, it says uh, the people had rebelled in chapter 24, yet he sent to prophets among them to bring them back to the Lord. See, every time he sent out a prophet, it was the idea was to bring them, the people back to the Lord. They'd gone far off. They were worshiping false idols and stuff, false gods. And he's trying to, the prophets, they're, they're giving warnings. Again, hey, you're doing wrong. Turn back to the Lord. Turn back to the Lord. And so yet they sent the prophets to bring them back to the Lord. These testified against them, but they did not pay attention. Again, and that's, our own fault, really. And as if it's not bad enough that the leaders are bad, it just kind of goes all the way down in verse 14. He says, all the officers of the priests and the people likewise were exceedingly unfaithful. Things have come to a pretty bad place. They were not just a little bit unfaithful, they were exceedingly unfaithful. Following the abominations of the nations, and they polluted the house of the Lord that he had made holy in Jerusalem. What God had set apart for himself in his own home. The whole book of Second Chronicles begins with that. Building this, this temple. Building this thing that God had made holy. And, and they polluted it. So you can see the low ebb that everybody had come to. And the common fate of all the four of these last kings was that they ended, each one of them ended up in Exile, in captivity. Each one of them um, ended up being deported to either Egypt or Babylon. And that's kind of where we'll pick up verse 15 now and 16. And Lord, the God of their fathers, sent persistently to them by his messengers, because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. 
but they kept mocking the messengers of God, despising his words and scoffing at his prophets, until the wrath of the Lord rose against this people, until there was no remedy. Look at here again. The Lord sent persistently to them his messengers. You have it again. God sends warnings to the people. They were living the way they shouldn't have been living, in sin and in, in bad ways and an abomination, doing evil in God's eyes. And yet, yet, God sends them messengers to hear from heaven. And isn't, it, isn't God merciful to send messengers to us, to proclaim the word of the God to us? Uh, God's merciful when he, when he sends his word to his people. At, he doesn't quit at the first no, you know. Zedekiah says stiffened his neck. It, it got stiffer and stiffer as time came. God's trying to get him to turn to him, and he, he won't turn his neck. But I like the word how it says persistently, don't you? Isn't that a merciful word in this condition? Persistently? Why? Why was God persistent to send them prophets to turn them back to him? Why? It says right here, because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. There you learn something a little bit about God, don't you? God is a compassionate God. He cares about his creation. Yes, they're going far off and doing the wrong thing. But he says, I love them. I love them too much. I, my heart goes out to them. I want them to turn back to me. And so I'm going to send Jeremiah. I'm going to send Bruce Gagne. I'm going to send Bob Hatfield, Hans Kaiser, different ones of you. God sends to speak his word. You know, the Bible says that he's not willing, that God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's the heart of God. Not willing that one, we, we somehow we have a wrong view about God, that he's up there as an angry God, just waiting to somebody to disobey him so he can squash him, and that's it. Yeah, I told you, there. Nah, it's not a did at all. You're reading the Bible wrong. How many times in the Bible does it say he's slow to anger, abundant in loving kindness? And you can see it through these kings. They, God says to do it one way, serve me. No, I'll pick another God. Thou shalt not murder. No, I want to murder somebody. You shall not steal. Well, I'm going to steal. And it goes on. Yet God persistently, even after the first warning, sends another warning. Just like air traffic control. One warning. That wasn't heated. Let's give another one. Why? Because they have a heart of compassion. There's people up there in that plane. And their lives matter. And God's concerned. What's their reaction to this? mercy, this compassion. What's the reaction of the people to God's compassion? Here we see it. They kept mocking the messengers of God. They just made a mockery out of it. Made fun of his messengers. Oh, he's one of those Jesus freaks. <laughs> they would call him whatever you want. Despised his words. These are just words and despise him, scoffing at his prophets until the wrath of the Lord rose against the people. That God's just and he has to punish sin. And eventually, he has to. His wrath is then poured out. And, and that's what was happening as the Babylonians were coming. What was that? That was the wrath of God against the way they were living. And yet he still said, turn, turn, turn to me and live. You know, I, I think that's the same reaction people get to the cross. The cross is one of the most beautiful stories in the ever told, right? A loving God would leave his heaven above and come in the human flesh and descend in this earth and live a perfect life for you and I. Set an example for him. It's how to live. Never did wrong, never sinned. And yet we crucified him as a criminal. And he did it, and he did it out of love to take the punishment for what I deserve, my sin. He takes it on himself on the cross. There's a reason, what verse we all know Matt's been sharing, one of the greatest verses in the Bible. 
For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. God so loved, so in such a manner. How, how, what kind of manner? Look at the cross. That's how much God loves the humankind. Let me say it this way. That's how much God loves you. Take it personally. Put your name there. That's how much God loves Dan Breckner. That he sent his only son. Gave him to die for you and me. But whoever believes in him should not perish. See the heart of God again. Should not perish. Not go to hell. But be, have everlasting life. And yet, how often do you hear people mock the crucifixion? mind? You talk about Jesus on the cross or something. The mockery that goes on. And so here as well. Um, until, and then it says here at the last words of verse 16, until there was no remedy. The literal word is healing. Until there was no healing, no remedy. Um, until there was no alternative. I mean, he kept saying it persistently, persistently, persistently. And so there was no other alternative but to send judgment after repeated warnings to turn them from, from their evil ways to turn to God. Now they had reached this point of no remedy. A really sad state to be in. You know, this, this catastrophe was prophesied had been really threatened since the time of King Ahaz, way back. This, this, this thing was being warned about, king after king after king, that this was going to happen. Been threatening since Ahaz. And it's all been, this catastrophe has been held back. Why? Only because of the faith and repentance of their individual leaders. And then the wrath was held back, remember? How many times? Oh, the, yes, God's going to send judgment through the prophet Huldah, or what was her name? The prophetess. And he talks about it. She talks about it, yes. But because you humbled yourself, you're not going to see it in your day. Isn't God merciful to us? Yes, wrath is coming, but because you have repented of your sins, you humbled yourself and turned to Christ. You're not going to see that day. And so here as well, uh, is it's held back only because of the faith and repentance of others. But now he comes to the point of saying with this people now in this group, he said there's no remedy. There's no healing. Therefore, verse 17, therefore. Again, you always have to see it in context because you could just take verse 17 by itself. Therefore, he brought against them, that is God brought against them, the king of the Chaldeans. But you always have to read, therefore, I always tell you that, when you see a therefore, go back and see what it is there for, and you find out everything we've been saying. Therefore, God brought up against them the king of the Chaldeans who killed their young men with the sword in the house of their sanctuary and had no compassion. See the difference there? Had no compassion on the young man, or virgin, or old man, or aged, and the ill, and so on. He gave them all into his hand. Gave them all into his hand. You see the difference between man and God? Verse 15 says that God, out of compassion, speaks through his prophets. And then because there was no more remedy, man comes on in, in, in judgment and so on, and has, shows no compassion. And you see that. It was a brutal... God. They, they didn't all go into captivity at once. This captivity took at least three de deportations to there. I think in the first one, 10,000 people. And that's only of those who survived the sword. And that's how Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and different ones ended up in Babylon. They were, God had his remnant. God always has his remnant. Remember that. As bad as things get, God always has his people. You can't put that light out. <laughs> God will always have his people, and that's a good thing. But things had become so bad in the kingdom that there was no other alternative, but God was going to work anyway. Um, let me just tell a little bit what happened again. Uh, people were slaughtered. All the vessels of the house of God and the treasures of God's house 
were taken to Babylon, as well as the king and the princess's treasures that they had. I mean, this was looted. Remember some, I forget which king, was it Josiah, who showed king of Babylon everything he had? Well, now they're cleaning house and taking it. Everything they, they kind of got with their appetite. Look what's in Jerusalem, man. And they clean house. They burn the house of God, broke down the walls of Jerusalem and burned its palaces with fire and destroyed all the precious vessels. And then he took into exile in Babylon anybody who had escaped the sword. And they became his servants of the king of Babylon. And that's what we read in the book of Daniel and others, right? They became his servants. Why, why did they do that? Why did all this happen? It said to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah until the land had enjoyed its Sabbaths. All the days that it lay desolate, it kept its Sabbath to fulfill 70 years. God always keeps his promise. Yes, judgment was coming. And that was going to, it fulfilled his word everywhere. You read that throughout the Bible. Notice that word when you read it. New Testament, especially book of Matthew. My goodness. To fulfill the word of the Lord. To fulfill the word of the Lord. Everything he promised came true. You know, the Bible tells us God cannot lie. Either we're going to start believing this book or not. <laughs> God is faithful to his word. That, that is so encouraging. In my, who was it the last week? I think Dave talked about Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. Something we can bank on. God doesn't change. I remember what Ruth used to think when I used to say, when our younger daughter used to say, God never changes. She thought he meant never changed his clothes. And so I, I have to be a little more careful with that. That God never changes in his character. All right. But uh, God doesn't change. What a, what a privilege. What a thing to know. And also to be sure in the Bible. That's why when you read something, uh, believe it if it's in the Bible. God's telling you that for a reason. You know what the devil's called? The liar and a father of lies. He started lying way back in, in the Garden of Eden. That's the first thing he did was lie and cast shadow of doubt on God and his character. Did God really say? But he's a liar. But the yeah, man believed the word of God. It fulfilled time after time. And this prophecy, Jeremiah was right. They were going to be in Jerusalem for, or in, in Babylon for 70 years. Um, but, you know, 70 years, that generation, a lot of them would pass away. There were very a few that, that remembered when they started rebuilding where these exiles were later. They went back to there, and we'll get into that in a minute. But uh, mostly it was younger people, obviously, now again coming. But 70 years, there's an end in sight. He tells them to build homes in Jerusalem. I mean, in Babylon. Build homes. You're going to be there 70 years. He says, I, I want you to rather increase, don't decrease. Keep having your children, he basically was saying, and, and don't, don't decrease there. Build, you know, homes. Uh, build your farms up. You're going to be here a while, so you might as well buckle in and, and increase here. And that encourages me, too, that when you're in a, in a, should we say, a, some kind of captivity or something, or you're really struggling through issues, that God can, it can be meant and used for your growth, your spiritual growth, for you to increase and not to decrease. And the false prophets were saying it that, oh, we're not going to be here long. Don't settle down. Don't be like, they're always there, always there. Um, God said they were going to be there 70 years, and they were 70 years. Hold uh, your place there. Go to Jeremiah chapter 29 for me, uh, with me there. Do you ever hear the word, you know, the plans that I have for you? People quote it a lot, but do you know the context of it? They're in captivity. <laughs> Jeremiah 29. I'll just start reading at verse 10, I think. Kind of get this. Jeremiah 29, 10. For thus says the Lord, uh, when 70 years are completed for, ba uh, completed for Babylon, I will visit you and I will fulfill to you my promise. And bring you back to this place. This is what we're talking about today, right? For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare, not for evil, 
In other words, for not not welfare as in a welfare system, <laughs> but for your well-being. That's the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will testify. Uh, I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. There's the promise of God that he was going to bring him back. You're going to be there 70 years, but you're coming back, and God fulfills his word. And see, the heart of God again is, look at the plans I have for you. To give you a future and a hope if you live for me. <laughs> and they could look forward to this day, and the day did come. How did it come? How did it come? What happened? The last two verses of this chapter of this chapter tell us. Verses 22 and 23. Now in the first year of Cyrus, the king of Persia, now the powers have changed. Persia has taken over the Babylonian and the Babylonian Medo-Persian government. Persia takes over. Cyrus is king. Uh, now in the first year of Cyrus, the king of Persia, the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah, that the word by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled. The Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, the king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all the kingdom uh, and also put it into writing. Here's what he wrote. Thus says King Cyrus of Persia, the Lord, the God of heaven, the God of heaven has given me all the kingdoms of the earth. He recognized where it, that God had allowed him to take uh, control at the, at the known world, really, at that time. That God of heaven has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has charged me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whoever is among you of all the people, may the Lord his God be with him. Let him go up. Let him go up to Jerusalem. Let him rebuild. The 70 years came to an end, and God stirred the heart of a king to send them back. How often does God do that? Speak even to pagan kings. Pharaoh had a dream. And God used those dreams and so on to put Joseph in power and to get things rolling there. But he, he spoke, and he, now he stirs the heart. See, that's why I have no world affairs don't, I mean, Sure, I get upset and so on, but I'm not too worried. I know God can stir up the heart of a king. And he stirs up the heart of Cyrus, and he lets the people go back. But it again fulfills the word that he promised through Jeremiah, that they would return. You see, God's faithful to his promise. He stirred his heart up. And... Uh, um, now they can go back and rebuild. And how different is this than the exodus of, of uh, Egypt, right? The, the, the ruler of Egypt at that time, the Pharaoh was unwilling to let them go until the death of his firstborn son. Then he reluctantly lets them go. And then after they're gone, he go get them. How different this exodus is. This ex mass exodus out of, out of Babylon coming back is supported by the king. He finances it. Hey, but you need to build this house. God told me to build. Here, take money. Get the governors over there to help you. You build this place. God has given you to do. Gentiles have always been involved in, the, in some way or another with God's work. <laughs> he stirs them up. And they build, they help build, rebuild the Lord's house that had been destroyed. The years and years are passing, right? We just go from one verse from verse 21 to 22, and 70 years are gone by. But God fulfills his word. Now they're free to rebuild the sanctuary. The end, the book really ends with a, a ray of hope, doesn't it? Remember, this is, these are the people that are come back now from Babylon, who the book of 2 Chronicles was written to originally first. They're reading this book, and they're coming to the conclusion, now we're back in the land, and we have to rebuild the temple. We have to rebuild the city the walls and, and build Jerusalem again. And they're reading through these kings and it's meant to encourage them, listen, follow God. Look at some of these other kings and you're, you're going to be susceptible to the same things. 
but if you humble yourself before me. And that's one of the main teaching of this, if my people which are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, forgive their sin and heal their land. And this is for us. And it encourages the exiles who are returning to walk with God. Let me just ask you a question. How do we make this applicable to our life? Has the Lord been speaking to you? Has the Lord been speaking persistently to you? I know for me growing up and for our kids, a lot of the speaking came from mom and dad. Turn to the Lord, encouraging their kids to walk with God. But kids, you hear that persistently. Did you realize that is the voice of God speaking through your parents? Wanting you to turn to the Lord. Remember Hans Kaiser when he stands up here and said his mom and dad would always talk to him about getting right with God. And my dad tells the same thing. Encouraging, turn to the Lord. But they finally the day came when they did. Never again. How do we respond when God persistently speaks to us or heed his warnings when we're doing the wrong thing, right? God speaks to us mostly, I think, through this book. Most often he'll speak to you through this book. It's a mirror. Look, a mirror. James calls it a mirror. We look in the mirror. He says if we're a persistent in it and we look at it and we really want to change, nobody goes to the mirror to to leave things unchanged when they see a bunch of dirt, you're going off to some special banquet and you got a bunch of dirt on your face from something you worked, you look in the mirror and you say, oh, I got to clean that. And so you clean it. That's what it's meant for to do. Now the mirror won't clean itself, clean you, right? The mirror's just there to show you the problem. The law won't help you. The law condemns you. It says you got, you got sin in your life. It doesn't help you, but it helps you turn to the one who can, who God would send to clean Clean you, and that's Jesus Christ. So God speaks through other people, preaching sometimes, or, or other people who talk to you about God. Through uh, providence, through life's experiences, God speaks, uh, and so on. But what's, what's our reaction? That's my question. And here in this last four kings, there wasn't a good reaction. They mocked the prophets. They mock the voice of God. Yeah, I think of Herod sometimes. He, he was so interested in John the Baptist. He would like to, almost like to hear him. But John had said something like, hey, you know, you're married to your brother's wife. That's, that's not right. Because of that, Herod, because of his wife, was so upset with it, she had John the Baptist put in prison and eventually beheaded. He silenced the voice of God. God was speaking through him, telling him, hey, Herod, what you're doing is wrong. You have your brother's wife. That's not right. He persisted and he silenced, he and his wife silenced the voice of God in their life. Then Jesus comes on the scene later on and Herod has a desire to hear from him. And Herod gets in front of him. Jesus doesn't say a word. Hmm. Why? You think God just speaks to you whenever... You call on him. I mean, when it, you, I man, pay attention when God speaks. He is persistent, but come to Him now. And today's your day. If you've never come to Christ, come to Him today. Admit you're a sinner. Tell Him. Make things right. He's maybe He's using me this morning just to persist and give you a heeding, a warning. Turn to the Lord and live. You know, the Bible says he has no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that they should turn. If you've never turned to Christ, today could be a new beginning for you. I promise you this, you, know, you seek God, you'll find him. You can encourage those people coming out of captivity. If you seek me, you'll find me. See the heart of God. He warns us out of compassion. Air traffic control is there. Their job is to keep the airplanes and, pilot and the, the pilots and the passengers safe. That's why there's a distance when you're landing. So what? 
And so the warnings, when they're not heeded, ATC gives another warning and another warning. And if they're not heeded, then disaster is going to happen. And it's no different spiritually in our life either. The only thing I can tell you, please don't go to the point of these kings where there was no remedy. There was no healing. And yet God in his mercy takes them to Babylon, brings them back, and they're going to rebuild. And they're looking, now people are looking for a king, a new king. And we get into the New Testament and find it's Jesus, the one that will never disappoint us, the one who all these kings did bad. There was not a good one in them, should we say, who was perfect. But there is pointed to the one of the line of these guys who would come one day and take away the sins of the world. And he's the one they were to look to. And he's the only king we should look to. And he's already come once and he's coming back again. And we can talk to him. He's alive. So God out of compassion sends warnings. But it's out of love. Turn to me and live. I promise you one thing. The Bible says if we confess our sins to him, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So if you turn to Christ today, it will be the best day of your life. I never regretted when I surrendered to Christ and became a child of God. I never regretted it. In heaven to this day, I'm not saying it's the easiest road, but I'll tell you it's the road of victory. It's a road of blessing. God's blessing. I wouldn't trade it for anything else. And that can be available. I don't know which word it would take you, but a walk with God is worth it all. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you today for your word. We thank you for your compassion towards us, warning us to heed your call. And that, Lord, we saw that every single king that humbled himself, you forgave and you sent blessing. And Lord, it's no different with us. Thank you for your warnings. They're, they're a sign of love that you care for us, that you don't want us to continue in our evil way, even as a parent would warn their child when they're headed towards disaster. So you're kind enough to do that to us, and I thank you, Lord. I thank you. Lord, we thank you for your mercy and compassion that has followed us all the days of our life. And I know we can say it's like Psalm 23 ends and your goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our life. And with you as our shepherd, it has, Lord. It has. And I thank you for that now. If there's anybody here, Lord, who uh, for the first time would turn to you, I pray you'd meet that person where they're at and show them your loving kindness and a better way of living, Lord. We thank you that. For your promises are true and you never lie. As many as received you, to you, those you gave the right to become the children of God. And we thank you for those promises in Jesus' name. Amen.